Hi, welcome back to the shop. This is the second part on building the small one-cylinder steam engine from aluminum castings. In the last part we did the base plate, which was a pretty simple part, and this time we proceed on with the A-frame. I have the A-frame already here on my grand surface plate, and to machine it, I clamped it against this box parallel. Um, this box parallel of course has in the center a cutout where this flange can sit in so so the these side ribs of the casting are resting against the box parallel and that's the reference surface to get it square when we machine up the, the bottom feet because we will first surface and drill the feet then we will put it on a face plate and machine the upper end on the lathe. And I hope this all works out as I plan. Um, it's not super important, but I want this this diameter down here kinder in the center to between these two feet. So. It's not um, crooked to one side and that's the reason why we're at the surface plate. And I have a square here. And I set the square up here against up here against the feet or the foot. And then I take one of my scales and I measure from the edge of the square against the, the flange of my part and I get uh, 22.5 millimeters. Keep that in mind, 22.5. I will write it down here, 22.5. Now we flip over to the other side and set up the square against the foot up here. Take our scale and measure from the edge of the square against the part and we have 23 almost 23 millimeters so 23 on this side 22.5 on this side I think that's close enough that's uh, 2.025 millimeters uh, off center and for casting that's more than good enough Next we'll drop this on the mill and surface these two feet. Okay, I set up the, the box parallel with the A-frame on the milling machine, clamped it down with two bolts and right now I'm in the process of machining down the two feet. And what I did, I added two screw checks that support the feet from bel uh, below them because I, due to the large overhang, I got some harmonics in there. But these screw checks, I, I slightly tensioned them. Um, they ch they helped a lot. And I'm taking pretty light passes with this uh, 14 millimeter end mill. And we're about a millimeter to go. Yes, I said about a millimeter because the top surface where I can measure to is a raw casting. So hmm. the overall height of this thing will matter later. But as now, no problem. And another five tenths of a millimeter. Okay, I already center drilled the position for the bolt holes. Now we're going to open up the holes with a 3.2 millimeter uh, twist screw that I chucked up very short in the ER16 chuck. Get some cutting oil and some RPM. And Oh. 
Sure. There we go. That's, uh, that's it for this setup. We only need to deburr these holes very slightly, just by hand. Just give it a light chamfer. Okay, let's take out the screw checks. And these are normal screw checks, but they have a 6mm bore on the top where a, a dowel pin can be put in. The dowel pin has a around the top and this gives a nice uh, point support for rough surfaces like this casting. And the Bessie clamp. And there we have it. We have the bottom surfaces nice and square. To the outer, to the to the piece. Okay, now we need a way to hold this A-frame on the lathe, and for that matter, I don't have a faceplate for this lathe, but I have these. These are sacrificial faceplates that I can chuck in the lathe, like a subplate, and as you can see, there are already some holes in it and we will drill four new holes in this piece and uh, chuck this up in the lathe and turn this upper area here. So let's go to the, to the milling machine, punch in those four holes and uh, put it on the lathe. Okay, I just drilled for the three mil for the three millimeter tap. Now we're going to tap these holes and go over to the lathe. I have the faceplate in the three channel. I indicate it so it runs uh, true on the diameter, and I took a very light skim pass on the face, so this is also true. And now we can take our A frame and screw it on onto these threaded holes that we just drilled and tapped into it. This will be good enough. Um, we will very carefully face off the, cent the end, center drill it and put a center on there. Then we will skim this outer diameter or machine it to final diameter and then we will set up the steady rest so the setup gets way more safe. Uh, right now I'm not. <laughs> And that was the cover of my lamp over the lathe. Okay.
Okay, we will take a very careful face cut until we can get a centered board or a center drill. A proper center, that's the right term. Let's see. Okay, now the center area is flat and we can get a proper center in there. Okay, now with the live center of course the setup is very safe. No more worries that it might come loose. Now we can machine this outer diameter. Okay, we're at the bench and this is the lathe tool I was using and as you can see there is a built up edge and we will mark that off and give the tool a rehome. Now I like to use these triangular grinding stones and we will just work the surface, the chip surface or the top surface of the lathe tool and I like to do it by holding the tool in the hand and holding the stone in the hand and you feel when they align um, you can tip it in position and then when you move the stone the tool the tool bit in your left hand will follow the the motion of the stone so you don't round, round over the edge you just want to flatten the top surface and then you can also give the front surface a light touch and the side rake also slightly it doesn't need much you want just the area where it's cutting to be shiny no need to polish the whole whole surface um, I grind these tools on the outer diameter of the grinding wheel and that gives it a, a hollow in the center you can see that the grinding stone my hand stone only touches on the edges and that's perfectly fine and to finish it we can touch up the radii too now we have a perfect lathe tool back in service and yes there is this coloration from grinding also on this side um, the trick with high-speed steelers you can not soften it on the grinder. If it turns blue, let it get blue. Um, to soften high-speed steel with cobalt, it's almost impossible by heating it. You can even heat them red hot, bend them and let them cool down on the air. and They will still be hard as before. So I don't care about uh, letting them get blue on the on the grinder um, the, the um, the old saying that you shouldn't uh, let the tool get colors when you grind it is in my mind out of the days when people were still using um, normal carbon tool steel for lathe bits those lose their hardness in a second but high-speed steel with cobalt Super tough. Can, you can almost not uh, t uh, take the hardness out of it. Okay, back at the lathe. Clean out the tool post so we don't clamp on some crap. 
and get the tool bit back in. And I still have not made um, more screws for these tool posts. That's still to come. And it's still the nature of the cast aluminum that it's always a bit rough, but uh, we will, we're getting there. We'll take another measurement. 50.5 and I will check that with the micrometer. Uh, let's check it with the 50 to 75 millimeter mic. And we have 50 50.55. Okay, last pass I changed to a braced carbide tool with kind of big radii for finishing. And I increased the speed also. And as you can see, this tool leaves quite a nice finish. Uh, and let's check the diameter one last time. Uh, and that's what I like, 50.0. As a, or it's it's just 50. That not so. Okay, right now I'm just hogging away most of the material up here um, because this set setup is the most rigid. With the life center I can take quite a heavy cut. When I change over to the steady rest um, it will be still pretty stable but um, the life center is superior. Um, I'm just hogging away the material to a layout line so I get my overall height. The overall height of this um, A-frame should be 138 millimeters, and I hog it to 140 so I have still some material to finish it. And I take a 2 millimeter pass. Okay, this is one of the rare occasions where I can use my neat Helios uh, depth mic. I, don't, I rarely use it. I don't have really much use for it as I do mostly small parts. And now I can measure the overall height from the upper flange against the uh, feet of the um, A-frame. And this is 0.96 millimeters, um, 100 and 139, no, 138.96. Uh, that should be so. 0 0.96 millimeters have to go. Um, yeah, here is, the dial in. here is the dial indicator of my bed slide. I will dial in 0.5 millimeters. 
for first pass or wait let's do 0.7 millimeters and then do a finishing pass okay and this is the finishing pass now we should be at 138 millimeters Okay, now we machine the left side of this flange and I brought the, the tool post around so I can get in with this tool I found in my collection. Um, this is a, a straight tool with a nice nose radius and with nose radius I will create a, a nice uh, intersection between the machine area and the casting itself. So you don't have a sharp corner there. Um, you might be able to see the scribed line here. That's where we have to machine to. to. Um, the final thickness of this flange will be 5 millimeters. Okay, I touched off on the outer diameter. Now I can face in. And of course the tool with big radii tends to chatter slightly. That's let's see if some oil helps with the chatter. Okay, let's chamfer these edges. And I also chamfered the transition from the turned part to the raw casting. Just to give it some appearance. Okay, I set up the steady rest. Um, the steady rest I have has bronze fingers, which I prefer over the roller style. Um, and I have them only very, very, very light, lightly touching the, the machine surface here. Um, most of the forces are still taken by the four screws that hold the piece to the faceplate. Um, I already face, faced away the, the small knob there with the center drill. And now we're going to take a center drill, center it, drill it and uh, bore or ream it. I have to check if I have a ream up big enough. That would make fast work, but if not, we will bore it. Okay, let's do the center drilling. And now we change to a 10 millimeter drill bit.
Okay, there we go. This is one of those free flute drills to open up holes. They don't have a... They don't cut on the center so you can't drill into solid material. You always have to have a pilot hole. Normally these are used to open up holes in... pre-cast holes in castings. But they work also for tasks like this very well. With these three flutes they run way more uh, subtle than a two flute drill bit when opening up, opening up holes and reduce the speed of it. And we add some oil to the steady rest and have a go. And as you hear, these cut super smooth. And we're through. As you hear, the industrial bit really runs super smooth. If you can get your hands on these three flute drills to open up holes, if you do a lot of uh, drilling on the lathe and have to open up holes, these are the way to go. They are not super expensive and you can, um, and they hold the edge pretty long as they have one more cutting edge than the average drill bit. And this is how they look on the front. As you can see, no center cutting. Okay, this is my boring setup. Uh, this is a long 12 millimeter boring bar with a carbide tool bit in front here. And it's extended out quite a lot and we will see how this works. Um, in aluminum we might get away with that much overhang and steel this would be hopeless but aluminum it's like spruce uh, so let's give it a try of course I did already a, a shallow test pass to see how it works and it didn't sing me the song of death so maybe This is one millimeter, uh, 0.5 millimeter depth of cut, one millimeter in diameter. And as you can hear, I don't get any harmonics. I think I even can increase the speed slightly. This worked. This worked reasonably well. I return the tool and make sure that I don't hit anything. We have a first pass with the boring bar, and we have quite a lot of chips in there. But it works, so we can proceed to bore it to 18 millimeters. Right now we are at. Uh, 17.5 That's 0.5 to go um. Okay, let's talk very briefly about internal measurement There are some different ways of internal measurement of bores There are the snap gauges that are seen a lot in outside of Germany. In Germany almost no one uses these. Um, I see a lot of the um, folks in the US use them and have very nice results with them but uh, I don't have them and I think I will not get them. I have other ways to measure internal bores. Then there are three point internal mics and in my mind that's the most precise way to measure internal bore but they are horribly expensive. A single 
internal mic three point costs about 200 to 500 bucks and it has only a range of one to two about one or two millimeters depending on the size of the micrometer then there are the two point internal mics these are useful they have a big range they go from five to up to uh, i think 55 millimeters but you can't go very deep into a bore so for deep bores useless but still good to have around and then what's very common with the guys that do work on motors boring cylinders and stuff like that are these internal measuring uh, tools i don't know how they are called in in english um, you have a dial indicator up here you can uh, use a 100 millimeter or a 1000 indicator and down here when you insert them in a bore you get a reading on the dial indicator up there um, there are different tips for different uh, diameters you have to exchange them and then you have to set your then you have to calibrate this tool normally you would use gauge rings but gauge rings are expensive and there is another way to do it using a mic I want to measure a 18 millimeter bore so we use a, a gauge block stack of 18 millimeters make sure they are clean ring them together and you take your mic and you just close the mic down onto the gauge blocks and then you lock it now we have exactly 18 millimeters between the anvils of the mic and now we can use this to calibrate our internal measuring tool and you have to seek the high spot and then set the dial indicator to zero and as you can see oops this is a bit fiddly when you work around the camera um, you can see that my high spot is already zero as i have already calibrated it and that way now we can measure the bore um, i didn't make this up with the mics uh, Mitutoyo describes this practice also in the manual of their tool. This one is made by uh, uh, Schwenk, made in Germany, and it's a super nice tool. You can the, the box is be bit beat up, but it's still a precise and reliable tool. The um, dial indicator is a new one. It's a rebrand. I don't know who makes this. Um, it might be a Mitutoyo one or not but uh, the tool is very nice and this is the way to go if you have to measure a deep internal bore and be very precise and you want an accurate reading without to have uh, having to transfer the measurement from your snap gauge or telescope gauge to a mic because that also introduces an error uh, so let's go over to the lathe and take a measurement. Okay, you take your tool into the bore and then you pendle it around and also look for a high spot. And here is 0, 10, 20, 22. So it's 18 millimeters minus 2200 so we are at 17.78 millimeters up here and let's measure down here and for that we just go down go down go down search the high spot and we have uh, 21 that's 17.79 uh, uh, yeah that's not too bad one hundredths of a millimeter conical but that might be due to the tool the long deflection of the, uh, the long um, outrigging tool but as you can see that 
This is a very fast way to measure. The only problem with it is that you have to calibrate it for each use. But apart from that, very useful. So we need to go uh, another point to one millimeters. Okay, I took another pass, a final pass with the boring barn. Now we can take another measurement. And as you can see up here in the dial indicator, we are 18. Yeah, 18 plus minus one hundredths of a millimeter. And down here on the end of the bore. Yeah, that's also pretty much zero. There are some. The needle is, is a bit chumpy because some of the uh, um, tool marks in there, but the surface finish in the bore is also pretty good. And a nice thing on a steam engine, on a small scale steam engine, um, it will run in and wear in and after some use all the tool marks will be gone and it will run super smooth. Okay, I machined the in front here is a, a recess one millimeter deep that will later align the cylinder on the A frame. I machined that off camera, it's just boring. Boring a step, to, almost like a countersink. Um, that's all the turning work that's to do on the A frame. Now we can tear down the setup. So let's uh, take the setup apart. Yeah, that looks nice. I'm, I'm pretty happy how this came out. Um, and un unlock it from the chuck. So, here we go. That's the A-frame after turning. Doesn't look too shabby in my mind. <laughs> okay, I drilled the bolt pattern up here off camera. I just clamped the um, the A-frame to the machine's table, aligned it via the parallels that stand in the T-slot, uh, centered on it using the uh, dial test indicator and then drilled the bolt pattern using the, um, the DRO. And when you look closely you see that I almost messed up. There are a few uh, witness marks where I center drilled and then I realized that my bolt pattern is wrong. Um, the drawing calls for a eight hole, po well, eight hole bolt pattern that's um, turned by 22 and a half degree. And I entered that into the DRO, but I didn't change the end angle. I set start angle at 22.5 and end angle at 360, so the bolt pattern came out totally wrong. Um, in fact, the end angle needs to be 360 plus the 22.5. But, uh, yeah, I didn't realize that at the moment. And, yeah. That's the reason why I have some small marks from the center drill up here. But there will be a paper gasket later, so yeah, doesn't matter, but still, it's a bummer. Yeah, and right now we are setting up the rotary table to mill out the two uh, crosshead guide slots. Um, there will be one on this side and one on this side and I like to set up parts on the rotary table over at the bench where I can lay it down, I can set up my uh, dial indicator and do the work uh, as good as I want it to be and I will only have to set up two more clamps and we're good to go.
There we go. Let's go around, retighten them all. And we don't need to crank down like crazy on these. Just snap. Tighten them down in our normal matter. And let's check the run out. Yeah, it moved slightly. We are at uh, two hundredths of a millimeter. But that's still okay for this purpose. That's less than one thousandth of an inch. So, yeah. Okay, I set up the rotary table on the milling machine. Standing position, so the A-frame is level. And now I need to rotate it in a way that uh, that it's uh, level in that direction because uh, of appearance and how I do this I take a parallel and drop it on to these two ribs of the casting which are pretty much in line then I swing my dial test indicator around and swing over the parallel like this and comparing front to back and now you can see how much uh, difference I get from front to back it's about uh, here it's 0.05 and back here it's 0.42 and now I can rotate crank the the rotary table and adjust it. This is not a precision setup so this is more than good enough. This is about uh, yeah two hundredths of a millimeter so now we can lock the table the rotary table in position so it doesn't rotate anymore. Okay, I set up to hog out the slot with a 6mm roughing end mill. I drilled both end positions of the slot and I have, as I said, the 6mm roughing end mill in here. So we will rough out the slot to 6mm and then we will later come back with an 8mm end mill and do some finishing. That's a bit slow. Okay, we hawked out the first slot. Um, now we will finish it, then we will turn the part around 180 degrees and do the other slot. I could also reach through with a very long end mill, but this um, that would mean a cutting depth of uh, 25 millimeters or something like that. And no, I can turn it around. That's the reason why I have it on the rotary table and not just clamped up on a angle plate. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I finished the the crosshead slots in this uh, A-frame off camera. You saw me roughing them and then I came back with an 8mm finishing end mill, plunged down and just uh, went through in one path. And they came out pretty good. They are only to access the crosshead. These are not actual crosshead guides. Um, and that's all the machining that has to be done to the A-frame. Now we can tear down the setup and uh, hopefully uh, we don't drop everything on our machine's table.
but to protect our machine table we can place a piece of plywood so if something goes south Came out pretty good. I'm I'm happy even with the slightly mishap up here in the bolt pattern. Um, looks good to me. So I think that's it for this episode. Um, this might get pretty long. So uh, hope you enjoyed. Thank you for watching, and see you next time.